Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great day. My name is Chris Dudley. I'm the chief of staff here at High Point University, and I'm just so pleased at the tremendous turnout tonight. Um, it's going to be a special night. We have a really special guest here, Pamela Brown, and Pamela is one of dozens of very, very impressive people that we get to bring to High Point University. Uh, our students not only benefit from incredible faculty on our campus that they learn from every day, but we also have thought leaders and best-selling authors and journalists and people in broadcasting come to High Point University. Let me just read you some of these names. Uh, just uh, this afternoon I was driving around in my car and I heard on a national radio program Mitch Album. You guys know Mitch Album? Wrote Tuesdays with Maury. He's a sportscaster. Mitch Album was here. Thomas Friedman, best-selling author of The World is Flat. Malcolm Gladwell was here. Seth Godin was here. I don't know if you guys know of Denny Stragel. Denny was the former CEO of Verizon Wireless. Uh, Denny was with us. David Neal, who's one of the most, maybe two or three most important people in sports broadcasting, was here last year interacting with our students. And so we're really committed to bring these types of thought leaders and successful people in to interact with you guys. And so I'm so pleased that you took advantage of this opportunity uh, to come out tonight. Um, Pamela is an incredible person. I've had a chance to spend a little time with her today, and she has incredible energy. This morning, her day started with a very early morning interview on the local Fox affiliate, and she spent about five minutes with them talking a little bit about her career and what she was going to talk about tonight. And then we gave her a quick tour of campus. She uh, went to the President's Seminar on Life Skills and uh, did about 30 minutes there with Dr. Cobain doing Q&A in that session. Then we brought her to lunch. She got to interact with about 12 students who are broadcast majors. Then she went to two classes in the Cobain School of Communications this afternoon. <coughs> Pictures, video, all sorts of stuff. She had five minutes to look at her speech and then she's here tonight. So let me introduce you and give you a little information about Pamela before she comes up and shares with us. Um, she's a national correspondent and anchor for CNN uh, primarily contributing to the morning show called New Day. And she's not been at CNN a long time, but just in the past year, she's reported on the Boston uh, Marathon ter uh, terrorist attacks, the Cleveland kidnappings, um, and tornadoes in Oklahoma. Big, big things that she's had a lot of responsibility to cover, uh, to cover those stories, a lot of pressure. Uh, before she went to um, CNN in New York, she spent time in Washington, D.C. That was her first job big major affiliate in Washington, D.C., a huge job in broadcasting. And then prior to that, she's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, we're trying to get her a little purple influence. She has those blue influences, but we're trying to, to get her to wear some purple after today. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you give a great high point welcome for Pamela Brown. One, it is such an honor to be here with you today, and I have to say I am so humbled by this turnout. <laughs> I had no idea so many people were going to want to come and, and listen to me talk, and you know I see myself in so many of the young students that I've met today. Um, it really doesn't feel like that long ago when I was in college and trying to figure out what the next step in my life would be and where I would land. And so I hope that my story, my journey thus far, will will give you some some hope and inspiration. As uh, Chris mentioned, I've been at CNN for eight months now, and it's been a, a wild ride so far. Uh, we've covered a lot of big breaking news stories and anchoring on CNN, really sort of a dream come true. It hasn't always been an easy ride. And before I get to that and talk about um, you know my time at CNN and sort of the journey leading up to that point in my career, I just wanted to share with you all some of the work that I've done there uh, this far, and then I'll, I'll talk about um, those experiences after. is not exactly what you expect to hear from a juror. Mo, she clearly feels like she owes an apology to Martin's family. Does she? Absolutely. You don't also have to agree that the law was applied um, evenly or done, yes. you know, um, justifiably. Because okay, Mo, the point made, point made. We hear you. We hear all three of you. We appreciate your insight and your analysis, and we respect all of your opinions. Leslie, 
recently. We've seen it in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, Denver, Colorado, Santa Monica, California. Is there a particular part of the country that's more vulnerable to these types of shootings or not? Well, you'd like to think so, but unfortunately it's not. And do you think that the number really is to maybe intimidate the defense team into taking a deal? It, it very well could be the case, yeah. Victor. I was at that press conference with Prosecutor Tim McGinty, and he made it clear he's going to aggressively go after Ariel Castro. And what I think this reflects, the 329 counts, I think that it reflects that they want to make sure he, he's put behind bars and at the very least stays behind bars for the rest of his life. Two children in desperate need of lung transplants are hoping they will get the operation soon. A ruling this week makes them more quickly eligible for receiving adult lungs. So nice to have you along with us on this Saturday. We are following two significant storms out this hour. Tropical Storm Dorian is in the Atlantic, headed toward the Caribbean, while Flossie is in the Pacific, approaching Hawaii. Meteorologist Jennifer Delgado is tracking both in the CNN Weather Center. What can you tell us, Jennifer? I spoke to the carjacking victim, Danny, for more than an hour in an off-camera conversation. He told me that he is still recovering from the nightmare of being carjacked by Jahar and Tamara Zarnaya shortly after the Boston bombing. Now, Danny told me that essentially it was a Thursday night. He was just trying to relax, driving around in Boston. He pulled over to send a text. All of a sudden, Tamara Lanzarnaya walked up to the car's passenger side. Danny rolled down the window to hear what he was saying. And Tamara Lanz unlocked the car, got in, and told Danny to drive while pointing a gun at him. My colleague, Suzanne Malvo, knows all about ALS. Her mother has this disease. You know about this all too well, Suzanne. Um, and you've been working on the story involving your mother for a while. Now, I know it's very emotional to tell this story, but it's also you're doing some good because you're raising awareness about it. And, and I appreciate the attention that they're giving to this family. The fate of the Army private accused in the largest leak of classified information in U.S. history is now in the hands of a military judge. The word is Edward Snowden will stay in Russia, but for now the NSA leaker is still hiding somewhere in the Moscow airport. California Senator Dianne Feinstein is calling on San Diego Mayor Bob Filner to resign. Filner has been accused of sexual harassment, and just last week he said he would take a two-week hiatus for intensive therapy, but Senator Feinstein said that's not enough. He was fired for this. <laughs> Punchy, grabby, and kicking his players. But Mike Rice, whose annual salary was just increased to $750,000, also will get a $100,000 bonus for staying with Rutgers through the end of this season. Had he been fired when university officials found out about this video, he wouldn't have gotten the bonus. Amid calls for the dismissal of the athletic director, some Rutgers faculty members are so fired up, they're calling for the university president, Robert Barchi, to step down. We're a pretty good university, but I think our president does not, he does not uphold our values as a university. The investigation into Rice's behavior began as the university was vying for membership in the Big Ten. I don't see how we can stand in front of our students and say that we do this research, but when it comes to Big Ten money and when it comes to sports and getting in the Big Ten, that all those things go out the window and you can call people the filthiest little cums, homophobic and misogynistic words, and that's okay because this is about sports. Sports is not separate from education. Now the focus is on who at the university knew what and when. In an interview Tuesday, Athletic Director Tim Bernetti said this. I was aware of the tape when I handed down the suspension at the end of December. Did your president see this tape? Yes. But in a statement released yesterday, Barchi said he watched the video for the first time Tuesday. Our attempts to reach Bernetti and Barchi at the university were unsuccessful. Clearly, it was not the name. As the fallout grows, some of Rice's former players are saying the video is not what it seems. A lot of those times on the film where he was jacking up a player or throwing a ball at a player, he was really joking. Still, some faculty members want to garner more support for a letter demanding greater accountability on the part of athletics director Tim Bernetti. Also, in the state capitol, there are calls for a legislative investigation into what happened here on campus. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. You know, I was watching the presentation and listening to Chris speak earlier, and I thought, this hey, this sounds pretty good, you know? This, this is all coming together and it creates a certain perception. You all probably think, okay, I, I kind of get this. I, I have a certain perception of her. But what you've seen, what you've heard in the last 10 minutes, you haven't really seen the full story at all. 
Um, and, and I want to challenge that a little bit because what you've seen and heard, it highlights my accomplishments. It highlights all of the good things I've done, but what it doesn't include is the disappointments, all the setbacks, all the sacrifices, all the rejection like you just saw with that officer in the Rutgers story. Um, everything and, and the struggles that I've had to go through um, to get to this point in my career and in my life, you know, the truth is I'm really no different from anyone in this room. It's not like I have some um, special, unique quality or anything like that. I'm just like everyone in here and I was just in your shoes not long ago trying to figure out my future. And one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that sometimes you have to lose to win. And that sometimes out of failure can actually come success. And I truly believe the way that I've handled the disappointments in my life has set me up to handle the, the challenges in my current role as an anchor and reporter in CNN. In fact, what I learned from those failures and challenges really helped push me through a grueling start at CNN. The first two months on the job were high intensity. I was coming, covering three huge breaking news stories, and you saw some of the clips there in my reel. Uh, just a couple weeks after starting my job, one of the biggest stories in years happened, the Boston Marathon bombings. And I, when that happened, I thought, this is my chance. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to deliver. This is an opportunity. And they weren't going to send me because I just started. I was a newbie and young, and you know they, they weren't going to send me. And I thought, OK, I'm not all right with this. I'm going to get to Boston. So I actually marched right up to a producer and pleaded with him to let me go, knowing that this was a huge undertaking. Um, but I felt prepared for it. And I thought, you know, this is where I, what I've sort of practice in my career to get to this point where I can cover a big story like this on a big stage, in a worldwide stage, CNN, covering domestic and international. So my producer said, all right, pack your bags, you're going. Next thing I knew, I was on a plane uh, heading in to Boston. And that was the beginning of some of the most stressful and challenging weeks, really, uh, of my life, um, but also um, it was an opportunity that I'll never forget, and I'm so glad that I sought it out. Again, if I hadn't been prepared for it, I'd probably have, uh, it'd be a very different story. When I landed in Boston, it, it was a very fluid situation. At that point, all we knew is that three people had been killed in two separate explosions at the marathon, and including an eight-year-old little boy. It quickly became apparent, though, that this was an act of terrorism, that those explosions were intentional. My responsibility was to find people, to interview, and to uh, talk with my sources, try to get information so I could break news, start writing the story, putting all the facts together so that I could present it live in the morning. So I worked through the night, and there I was on CNN covering this huge breaking news story at 4 in the morning. And I remember my brother was watching in LA. It was 1 in the morning there. And he's, are you serious? You're already on CNN covering this huge story? And I, I know, I can't believe it. I didn't even have time to think, though, because I really was working around the clock. I mean, it was so intense. It was after I do live shots, and I'm running around trying to find people to interview who may have witnessed uh, the incident. And all, all these facts were being floating around, floated around, or I shouldn't say facts, information. And we were trying to to go through the information and see what was accurate, what we could report. It was, it was crazy. And just when I thought, all right, I can't handle this anymore. I'm not sleeping. This is just such high pressure. Just when I thought I was on the verge of collapse, I got a phone call at 2 in the morning on the fifth day. That phone call, the person on the other one was my producer, and he said, Pam, get up right now. There's a massive manhunt underway. The two suspects, they found the two suspects, and they're on the loose. you got to go on live on the air as soon as possible. I'm like, oh my gosh. What? 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 Just trying to sort of gather what he just told me. So they found the two suspects. There's a massive manhunt. Now I have to go live on the air and talk about this. Okay, let's get my thoughts together here. Uh, not long after that, the entire city of Boston was shut down. I mean, that's unheard of, really. It is. And there I was doing live shot after live shot. It was like, it felt like the apocalypse or something, or like a scene out of a movie. There were Humvees going by me, um, military personnel swarming around, helicopters up above. You just, you didn't know what was happening, and all you knew were these two suspects were on the loose. We'd, they could have been right behind me for all I knew. I mean, we, it was just, we were all kind of on edge, and it was a, a very intense experience, to say the least. But there I was, reporting live for CNN, covering this huge story. And after a couple weeks of that, no rest for the weary. I was flown straight into uh, Cleveland, Ohio to, uh, Cleveland, Ohio to cover one of the most 
sensational kidnapping stories uh, in recent memory, the, the case of three women held captive for around a decade by a man named Ariel Castro. I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this story. That was a story that captivated the nation truly. And as soon as I got there, I hit the ground running, uh, calling my sources, trying to get information. And within hours, there I was standing next to Anderson Cooper, uh, breaking news from some of the information that I'd had, uh, that I'd gotten from one of my law enforcement sources about the kidnapping. That was truly surreal, standing next to Anderson Cooper, live on CNN. I was doing one live shot after another, starting at five in the morning, working until 10 that night, and then doing it all over again the next morning, 5 a.m., there I was, live on the air, no sleep, a key theme, as you all can tell. You, you really, adrenaline can do amazing things <laughs> when you don't sleep and you have to perform under those high-intensity situations. After weeks of covering that story, I finally make it back to my new New York apartment. I had just moved in there. I moved to New York from D.C. and. I had all these boxes laying around that I hadn't had time to unpack because I was constantly on the road. And I thought, gosh, I'm so relieved. I'm back home. I can finally get settled into my new apartment. And I get a phone call. Well, next thing I knew, I was on a chartered plane going to Moore, Oklahoma. A massive tornado had ripped through there. And we were going right into the disaster zone. As everyone else was trying to escape and flee more, we were going right into it. And I thought to myself, well, Pam, here we go again. <laughs> I knew it. I sort of knew what was going to be ahead of me after going through those other two experiences. I'm like, you're not going to be sleeping for a week. Just, just sort of accept this reality. So there I was, after pulling an all-nighter, putting to go together my story. I was live on the air right outside, of, right outside of Plaza Towers Elementary School, where sadly a few kids were killed in the tornado. And then from there, we were, I was moved to a decimated bowling alley and hospital and just doing live shot after live shot, trying to do my best to give an accurate portrayal uh, of what was going on and the extent of the damage. And then after all these live shots, I had to start finding compelling people to interview who could share their stories. And let me tell you something. It is not easy approaching people who, who are truly devastated, who have lost their homes, lost a loved one. All they have is the, the clothes on their back. Um, but I had to do it because I had a bigger purpose of sharing their story to those who couldn't be there to see it firsthand. Uh, so needless to say, it was a tough week of working long hours and, and seeing pain and suffering firsthand. And that takes a, an emotional, physical toll. Uh, it was surreal covering these stories in the span of two months in front of a worldwide audience. I never thought at the age of 29 that I would be doing that. And there I was. I remember thinking to myself at that time, I thought, I'm really being tested right now. <laughs> this just doesn't seem to end. It hit me, though. I wouldn't have survived that test had I not had seven years of preparation as a reporter in Washington, D.C. And I wouldn't have had the strength and confidence to handle and navigate those tough, breaking news situations if I hadn't gone through setbacks and challenges leading up to that point in my life. I won't waste your time going through all my different setbacks. I have too many to count. I'm just going to share with you a few just quick examples of, of um, some challenges I've had in my life, disappointments up to this point that I think are most relevant. And just remember, you know, these are, at the time in my life, it's all relative. It was, it was a very big deal. Um, the first that, that came to mind was when I was rejected from um, a university that I, a top university I really wanted to go to. I received that rejection letter in the mail and it, it really felt like a personal failure. You know, I had laid out the best argument of, of why I should go there and laid out all my credentials and, um, they didn't choose me. <laughs> I hope they're thinking that now, right? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But you know, that, that's something that leaves an indelible mark. Opening up, reading that rejection letter, I thought, oh my god, this is so horrible. My senior year of college, I, um, I know some of, some of the students here in the room are seniors trying to find that job right out of college. And I thought I was going to end up at this prestigious internship in LA. And I was one of uh, thousands of people chosen as a finalist. And I had made, made my mind up. That's where I was going to go. I was going to be an entertainment reporter. And that was that. Well, I got the letter from them. And I was rejected. I wasn't chosen. And I thought to myself, how could this be? I mean, I had made all these sacrifices in college, had all these internships during the summer. I worked for Jefferson Pilot Sports, as we, many of you probably know, North Carolina. And I, was, I ran, just envision this, 
part of my job at Jefferson Pilot was to run up and down the sidelines in a big ugly blue vest, reeling in the cable behind the photographer. <laughs> it was not a glamorous job. But I'm thinking, here I was making all these sacrifices. I put so much blood, sweat, and tears while I was in college to set myself up for a bright future after college, and I was rejected from this internship. So right, I was a recent graduate and no job and no fallback plan. Lesson learned, always have a plan B, <laughs> because that was not a fun experience. After eventually landing my first job right out of college at a news station in Washington, D.C., um, this was actually probably one of the hardest times of my life. I was literally ripped apart on media blogs for being too young and too inexperienced to be in such a big market. Um, I'll never forget uh, a colleague pulling me inside. This is my first week there, and she said, there's this blog that everyone reads, and there's some really bad stuff that's on there. And of course, as a reporter, I'm curious. I'm going to go read it. So I read it, and it said, the morale has plummeted at my station because, all because of my hire. Others said that my hire represented the death of TV news. The list of mean comments that were said about me just goes on and on. And you can imagine I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed 22-year-old just eager to start my career. This was devastating. I really felt like I was just doomed from the start. In fact, as I was preparing my speech, um, I went back and actually read some of the viewer emails I've received over the years. And um, I'm not going to go into the mean ones, the really mean ones, because I'm not going to give them the time of day. But uh, I did find some, some pretty funny ones, so I'm going to share those with you, because they're, they're pretty entertaining. You know, there, there's one topic in particular that viewers just loved to, to share their opinions about with me. My hair. For some reason, my hair was a hot topic. It did go through phases, I'll, I'll admit that. So I, I went back and uh, you know, I thought, it, it always amazed me and, and at times entertained me because there I was covering these really serious stories, working long hours, trying to prove myself as a serious journalist, and then I would get emails about my hair. So I dug up a few gems uh, from some very observant viewers that I wanted to share with you all. Um, one was a note I got in the mail and all it said was, who cropped your hair and why do you hold your head at an angle? Signed B, it's the big B, okay. <laughs> Another viewer writes, I noticed this week you seem to have darkened your hair. Of course, that's entirely up to you, but your previous blonde made you stand out from the crowd. All right. But I guess <laughs> beauty really is in the eye of the beholder because another writes, your hair is too peroxide blonde. Why don't you make it look more natural? <laughs> so obviously, and another says, why don't you put, why do you put, uh, why did you put dark back into your hair? Breaking off? I mean, let me tell you something. These viewers are not afraid to share their opinions. You really put yourself out there in this job, but uh, seemingly can't win with that. Criticism, though, really is all, all part of the job of putting yourself out there. It's, it took me a while to get used to, and I'm, I'm still not sure if I'm quite used to it, but you've got to have that thick skin. Through all those experiences, I just share with you those quick examples. Um, you know, little did I know at the time that that adversity was actually setting me up for a success, all in the way I handled it. This all came together for me. I connected the dots a few years ago. I went to a speech. Uh, it was held by Carol Stern. She is the CEO of the UNICEF US Fund. And she said she was working on a, while she was working on a book, she interviewed a, a variety of professionals in various fields. We're talking, um, you know, doctors and, and teachers, you name it. She interviewed all of them. And she said there was one common thread with, with all of them. She said that they had all failed in their lives more than once. So we're talking the most successful people in the world in various fields. And what connected them all was that they had all failed. What made them different is instead of capitulating to failure, surrendering to it, accepting it, they challenged it head on and actually used it to their advantage. You know, this reminded me of my own grandfather. He was a very successful attorney, but he ran for public office, get this, more than 20 times. More than 20 times. He lost three times more than he won. In fact, he was still running for office, public office, in his 80s. At 81, there was a television reporter that asked him, fair enough, do you feel like a failure? Because you've lost all these races and you're, you're still trying. And his response was simply, the only way you fail in life is if you fail to try. And I just thought that that really was so poignant and really sums it up. So 
you know, I had to think, well, what have I personally learned from not succeeding at first? Well, for one, it opens the door to an opportunity that may even be better for you. You know, thinking back to college, I was rejected from that one university, only to get into another university that was probably the, the best fit possible for me. I mean, honestly, my years I studied at UNC Chapel Hill were arguably some of the best years of my life. Uh, not only did it set me up for a wonderful career in broadcast journalism, but I also made my best friends in the world at UNC Chapel Hill. You know, I may not have been selected for that uh, prestigious LA internship that I thought for sure I was gonna land, but that experience forced me to dig in my heels and find another opportunity. It's amazing what you can do when you're desperate, right? <laughs> the next two months, I just spent making phone call after phone call, setting up meetings, flying across the country to different stations and meeting uh, with news directors. I flew out to California to attend a workshop to put together a newsreel. Uh, one news director after another turned me away and said, you need to start off in a smaller town. Sorry, you can't start off in this market. In fact, there was a, a station in Spokane, Washington that seemed interested, and at that time I thought, gosh, this would be huge if I could end up as a reporter in Spokane, Washington. <laughs> so I walked into a station in Washington, D.C., and I remember thinking, this is such a great networking opportunity. I walked into uh, the news director's office and met with them, and next thing I know, the words, you have a lot of potential, I want to hire you, came out of his mouth. I, I wouldn't be like, for real, is this, am I being punked or something, really? <laughs> but he, sure enough, he was willing to take that risk. And he ended up hiring me as a reporter in Washington, D.C. It was a dream job and completely unexpected. So that opened the door for me. That's great, right? But then I had to prove myself and earn the respect of my uh, skeptical colleagues and viewers. That was not easy. Uh, I was determined to win them over, but I first had to prove to myself that I could do it. I mean, I was 22 years old in a huge market with very little experience other than what I had done at UNC Chapel Hill. But I didn't give up. I kept my head down, I worked hard, I took on every tough story I could and volunteered as much as I could. Whenever they needed someone, I just would raise my hand, so I'll do it. I also um, took on every tough shift you can imagine. Any, any, horrible hours you can think of, I did that. I promise you I did. I was getting up at 2.30 in the morning during the week. I was uh, working until midnight, 1 a.m. on Saturday nights. I was working Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings. I would be driving to work on the weekend mornings and seeing other people my age just leaving the bars. <laughs> and there I was going to work. I didn't know what these sacrifices would lead to. I just had this belief that, okay, this is gonna add up to something, but let me tell you, I went home so many times and just cried and called my family and just cried. I said, everyone wants me to fail. They're expecting me to fail. I'm losing my 20s. Like, this is social suicide. I'm working all these crazy hours and I, I, what am I gonna get from this? I, I just, I, why am I putting myself through this? Really, why am I putting myself through this? But again, I just kept thinking, okay, Pam, you're gonna get through this, you're, you're gonna persevere. And eventually I did persevere through the cacophony of criticism surrounding my hire there. In fact, at the age of 23, my boss gave me my own show to anchor, which is virtually unheard of in a, a, a market like DC. Um, a few years after that, I was only one of a handful of journalists to end up in Haiti, covering the earthquake there in, in, in 2010. Um, and of course that was an unforgettable experience. And so, you know, I, when I left my job this February, my boss pulled me aside and, you know, I think it was an emotional for him because he was the one that sort of rolled the dice, he took that risk on me, and he saw all the hardship I had to go through in the beginning when I faced all that criticism and, and doubt, and he said to me, he said, you know what, you're one of the hardest working journalists in this newsroom, Pam. He said, you lack this field and determination, and I use you as an example to my daughters. So that was a pretty cool compliment, um, and it, it really uh, means so much to me that because of my hard work and sacrifice, that, th that that's what he thought of me. In fact, I was thinking about getting my job at CNN and how it all ties together, because when I was interviewing at networks like ABC, ABC News and NBC and CNN, Guess what they were doing? They were calling my colleagues. They were calling the colleagues that were skeptical of me in the beginning, that doubted me in the beginning, and asking me, asking them what they thought about me. And those same colleagues that doubted me in the beginning 
told them, well, she's one of the hardest working reporters we have, you should hire her. And so the fact that I made those sacrifices, not even knowing what that was gonna lead to and worked hard and kept my head down, I truly believe that is why I ended up at CNN. Because if they had called about me and they said, well, she's spoiled rotten or she you know, doesn't work hard or she, this or that and the other, they weren't gonna hire me. It was that reputation that I had built through those years that really was, I think, the reason why, why I ended up there. So all of these experiences, they no doubt shaped me, had a tremendous impact on my life. You know, they gave me the thick skin and the confidence to handle the scrutiny that comes with being in the public eye. You know, because I went through all that scrutiny at ABC7 in Washington, D.C., I'm able to, to handle all the criticism that comes with being on such a big stage at CNN. And it also gave me the tools to effectively, effectively navigate all the tough breaking news situations that can be thrown my way at any given moment. They could call me right now and say, Pam, get on a plane, you need to go cover this big story, and I'd have to go. And more than anything, these, these experiences taught me that you have to believe in yourself, because if you don't, no one else will. When I was at ABC7 and, and no one believed in me and I didn't even really believe in myself, I had to fight and I had to think, have the confidence to stay in there and stay in that fight and persevere. I've learned that failure is a critical part of life because it's also a part of humility. You know, it's taught me that it's okay to strive for perfection, but winning and always being perfect, they're futile pursuits. Failure is what makes us stronger, it builds our character. If we never go through pain and challenge failure, how are we gonna grow and, and build our character? And sometimes, in some ways, I've learned that there's no such thing as failure, but instead an opportunity to find something better and to do something better the next time. So what I hope that you learn from my personal journey is that there's no path that's paved for you, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter where you came from. The exciting part is, is that you get to carve your own path. You get to make your dreams, your hopes, your realities, or your, your realities, <laughs> your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations are reality. That's up to you. It's all how you deal with those hardships, how you deal with the disappointments in your life. You know, some of it is pure luck. I think I got lucky a lot during the way. I really do. But a lot of it is how you deal with those challenging situations and prepare yourself for future opportunities. Again, it's not what happens to you. It's not the disappointments that define you. It's how you deal with them that defines you and sets you up for success later in life. Similar to how I really believe that it set me up to take advantage of my opportunity at CNN. Preparation for future challenges and opportunities is an endless journey. I am still preparing every day for what's ahead. That doesn't end. And honestly, the reality for all of us in this room right now is that we all face more stumbles along the way. Some will be bigger than others. And as you face them, just remember that the way that you handle those losses along the way is what will make you a true winner. So thank you. And remember, even if you lose, don't lose the lesson. <laughs> So much and I just want to open this up now for for Q&A any questions you all have feel free to ask me I'm, I'm really an open book and would love to hear your questions and don't be shy don't be nervous feel free to raise your hand sure okay Well, I, I don't, <laughs> but we can surely discuss this after, and I, we can talk about that and learn a little bit more about it. I really don't have a good answer for you. I don't, I don't. Yeah, well, thanks for coming out. I really appreciate it. Does anyone else have any more questions about sort of my experience at CNN so far? Go ahead. Well, obviously, it depends on um, what field you want to go into. Are you are you interested in broadcasting? Okay. So broadcasting, and I know that this isn't of interest for everyone in this room, but broadcasting, 
for me, I think the most important part is your reel, which is what you all saw there, um, the clips of some of the work I've done at CNN. So basically kind of a highlight of your best, your best work um, is extremely important. Um, in all honesty, my reel was absolutely horrific in college. <laughs> I wish I could go back and look at it now because it was terrible. Um, and I actually went to a workshop and, and, and had a reel made that I then presented to my boss in DC. And I, I sometimes wonder to this day if I'd shown him what I'd made in college, if he would have hired me. <laughs> so I would really make that a priority is to, to put together a, a good reel and also network, get out there. Think about, like I think about what I did after I graduated, I didn't get that internship in LA. I just kind of made a list of all the people that I knew and just called them and just said, hey, do you know of anyone else I could meet? Or do you, you know, you just gotta kind of be proactive and, and persistent and put yourself out there and take the initiative to meet with as many people as possible. Just network, network, network. So many, so, so many successful people are just really good at, at networking and good at building relationships. So I encourage all of you in this room, no matter if you're in broadcasting or you're going into finance or whatever the case may be, Build, find people out, seek them out, find mentors, and build relationships. It's extremely important and will serve you well, really, throughout your life. Yep? Did you have um, previous like internship experience before you went out and tried to get a job, or were you kind of, did you just kind of go at it? I did. I think intern, interning is, is, is very important, and it, it exposed me to all different facets of uh, broadcasting. And I actually, I started out interning in high school as a, uh, at a local news station in Lexington, Kentucky, which is where I'm from. And then from there, I interned at MTV in New York. Uh, I interned at Fox Sports. I had no interest in sports at all, but I thought, well, this will be a cool opportunity, and that was in LA. And I also interned for uh, Senator Hillary Clinton in Washington, which was just an incredible experience. I tried to find internships where I felt like I could learn something new from the internship before, and Obviously, as a reporter, you cover a lot of politics, and so it was really cool to see the inner workings of Washington and be behind the scenes and, and intern for her. So I, I highly recommend um, internships. I think that they, I don't think that they affected me being hired in that. I don't think my boss looked at my internships and said, oh, you've had all these fancy internships, I'm gonna hire you. But I think that it, it really gave me the experience and the, the first-hand look at how the business works to, to help me succeed in my job. Yep. Such, I love that you asked that question because so much of being successful for me is not what you see on camera. It's everything I did leading up to that, what I did in my free time, what I did in the moments where I could choose what I was going to do with my time. And I spent a lot of time reading, trying to keep up to date with current events because if you're anchoring, they can get in your, your earpiece and say, hey, Pam, this just happened, breaking news, go live with it. And now all of a sudden I had to talk about whatever event just happened or whatever news, breaking news just happened. So I always try to, to, um, to be sort of well read and, and up to speed with current events. Um, and you know, it's, it's just meeting with people, having coffee with sources. Um, I always say a big part of being, having longevity in this business is having sources. You know how you always see reporters say, well my source says this and we have this breaking information because of my source. Well, a lot of that is what I do when I'm not, when I'm in my own free time, I'll go meet up with the source over coffee or have a drink and, and sort of build that relationship. Again, it goes back to building the relationship. Um, so that's a big part of what I do in my free time. And just trying to, you know, go back and look at my work and critique it and think, okay, what can I do better next time? I always, I think I've looked at every, I'm not kidding, I've looked at every live shot I've ever done and every, um, anchoring segment I've ever done as well. I go, I always go back and look and think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this better next time. I'm really hard on myself, which can sometimes be to my detriment, but um, that's something else I do. But what you do in your free time, what you choose to do with your time, is also what can make you very successful. Who else? Yep? How do you deal with the competitiveness of your career? It's not easy, um, and it's, more competitive than ever now with Twitter and um, social media. It's, added, it's really added a whole new dimension to this job. Um, you know, I'm a naturally competitive person, I think. <laughs> so I kind of enjoy that. 
Um, but it's, it's not easy. Um, there's nothing worse than when you're covering a story and NBC gets the scoop and you don't, you know? So I think that I just try to, to um, you know, work my sources, as they say, in the news business and just try to stay ahead as much as possible and to, to you know, just put my all into a story if I'm on it. And I, I think what it is is just focusing more on myself. I think the best way to be competitive is to focus on yourself instead of your competitors what I've learned along the way, if that makes any sense. Um, so just focusing on me and what am I doing and how am I going to get ahead, not focusing on what the other guy's doing, as hard as that can be sometimes. So There's got to be more questions. Good. There you go. Yep. actually through trial and error. Um, I knew I wanted to be a broadcaster from a really young age. I can remember always wanting to, to be a broadcaster. My mom was actually a sportscaster on NFL Today, so might be of interest to some of you sports junkies out there. And so I kind of grew up in the business, around the business, and um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do, but I wasn't really sure kind of what path I was going to go down. And I actually thought, it's so interesting to look back and think about this, I thought I was going to end up in LA as an entertainment reporter thought for sure that's what my path was going to be. It just shows you that uh, life often happens when you're making a plan. And life had another plan for me, and that was being a hard news reporter. So um, it's, again, going back to what I was talking about in my speech, you know, ha had I gone out to LA and done that internship and gone down that path, it just would have been a completely different life. This was really has been the best fit for me. And I've, I, now that I'm doing hard news and covering so many um, important stories on, on a daily basis, I can't see myself doing anything else, really. So uh, to answer your question, no, I thought I was going to do entertainment news, and then because I got the job in Washington, D.C., and that all worked out, um, this is really what the best fit for me is that I've discovered. Yeah, I mean, um, there <laughs> I think my mom was more worried than I was. <laughs> she, uh, she, it's funny. She's. I, I want to go overseas more, and I want to. I want to go into war zones. I want to be there where the story is. And my parents are like, "No, you're not. You're staying. You're staying in New York." But um, I, I, I definitely think you know. I, when I covered, when I went to Haiti um, right after the earthquake, it was a very tumultuous, dangerous situation. It truly was. I mean, there were there were inmates that were on the loose, and, and I mean, it was it was just about as chaotic as you can possibly imagine. So that was probably a little more um, of a dangerous situation than, than, I, than I probably would have liked to have put myself in. But I was with um, military personnel, I was with the search and rescue team, Fairfax. So I was always surrounded by a lot of people. Um, so I did my best to take certain safety precautions. But honestly, this job comes with risk. And you sort of have to put yourself out there in those dangerous situations and tell the story. So. I've sort of accepted that part of the job, but you, you also have to be smart about it and aware and um, be with the right people who can protect you if, if need be. So. Yep. Hi, um, thanks for telling me about your news today. But my question is, especially you being in the DC market, dealing with a lot of political um, situations, and then also being in such dramatic situations with the Boston bombing, is it ever difficult? That is a truly great question. Um, and actually, Haiti Haiti is probably the hardest story I had to cover where I was really challenged in that way. Um, I, I mean, you're seeing dead bodies. You're, the, the worst situation you could ever think of. That's the situation I was in in Haiti. Um, and I remember just uh, feeling overwhelmed with my emotions at first. And I thought, OK, Pam, you've got to get it together because you have a bigger purpose here, and that is to tell these stories. And in order to do that job, in order to fulfill that bigger purpose, you've got to put your personal emotions aside and you have to stay focused. Um, and so that was a real learning experience for me. And I, I was able to do that eventually. And so that's sort of um, what I try to adopt when I go on tough stories like the Boston Marathon, like Oklahoma, when I was going up to these people who were truly devastated. Um, I try to, to always show human compassion. That's first and foremost the most important thing you can do, but also Try not to get too emotionally 
drawn into the story uh, because of what my job is and my bigger purpose. That's what I have to, to stay focused on. But it's not always easy, and I really have to um, be proactive about when I'm, when I'm done reporting these stories, and especially after that two-month span where it was one tragic story after another of taking the time to sort of reflect and to digest it all and to um, make sure that it doesn't come back to haunt me down the road, if that makes sense. Anyone else? Yeah? How do you kind of describe the loss going on with that one? Like you said you went from place to place. How do you just like control your emotions in that sense? Not just your uh, personal emotions, but how do you just keep cool? Keep cool under pressure. Yeah. Um, I think it takes a lot of experience of just repetition of doing that over and over and over again. And um, someone once told me the more chaotic it gets, the calmer you should be. And um, so I just try to stay zen-like. <laughs> I do a lot of yoga when I'm not working, so I try to practice that, go tap into my what I learn in yoga class. And also, um, I talked about this to a class earlier, I go into what's called a mental green room. I learned this in college where you just sort of picture, I picture myself in a mental green room where I can just, just block everything else out, all the chaos around me, and just sort of relax and just sort of clear my mind before a live shot because um, it can be very challenging to be in those high intensity breaking news situations when you're around so such a um, you know a emotional situation and then to go live on the air and stay calm is not easy so I just try to again go do the mental green room thing before I go live on the air and just try to remind myself that the calmer I am the better I will be able to do my job and the more the viewer will listen. Because if I'm all worked up, um, then the viewer will feel worked up watching me. They'll feel uncomfortable. I'm someone that I want, I want the viewer to feel comforted listening to me. I'm covering a tragic story, but I want them to be able to listen to me and know that I'm okay. It's all gonna be okay, you know? And, um, but it's a challenge, and I think that's a really good question. Yeah? Oh man, <laughs> I have a lot of um, favorite parts of the job, but I definitely think actually being out in the field and covering breaking news is my favorite. Um, I love to be the first to break news and to come out with information that no one else has. And especially at CNN, it's so crazy because um, when you cover these stories, everyone picks up on it. So I'll, I'll for example, I was covering this horrific story in Danvers, Massachusetts recently. You all may have heard about um, a teacher that was killed there by allegedly by one of her students. It was horrible. But I, I was able to, to break some news there. And um, next thing I knew, I was looking at all these different websites like the Daily Beast and all these other ones, and they were using the information that I had just reported on their sites and saying, you know, according to CNN, this is, this is what we learned about this story. And I was thinking, gosh, this is so surreal. You know, um, but it's, it's, I just, I really enjoy the um, sort of the intensity and the challenge of covering breaking news. And it's, it's always very rewarding too when you can get through an experience like that and, you know, feel good about, about your performance. Um, something else I just thought of too is I was in, I was in DC recently covering the Navy Yard shooting. Um, you all remember this. There was the, the gunman that went into the Navy Yard and, um, again, there I was, in the breaking news mode, and um, everyone had been widely reported that the gunman had used an AR-15. And all of a sudden, one of my sources contacts me and says, we're, we're pulling away from that. I don't think that that's what the gunman had. So here I was, everyone, I mean, the most respected journalists were, were, were reporting that this gunman had an AR-15, and I was the first to come out and tweet that in fact, we've learned that he wasn't carrying an AR-15, and it got retweeted more than 500 times. It was picked up on the Washington Post. The Washington Post had two articles on it and copied and pasted my tweet. <laughs> um, and at the time, I'm not gonna lie, it, was, it, it felt kind of scary because I was the first one to come out with that breaking information, and no one else had, been, had, cor had corrected it at the time, so I thought, oh my gosh, what if this is wrong? You know, you do have that moment of panic. But there's nothing like the feeling of like, okay, it felt pretty good to be able to sort of 
set the record straight and um, make such a difference like that. Um, so, you know, I, I guess to answer your question, it's just I love covering breaking news. I think that's probably my favorite part of the job, among other things. <laughs> yep? What was your biggest sort of, oh no, did that just happen on the airplane? <laughs> oh, I've got plenty of those. <laughs> I know, I was joking earlier. I mean, I wish I had a blooper reel to show you all because I have so many, so many mistakes that I've made on the air and so many times that I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to end up on YouTube. <laughs> Fortunately, it hasn't, knock on wood, but I'm sure it will, and I'm sort of a, a, anticipating that happen. But um, something that comes to mind that I, has just left such a mark on me was when I was at Channel 7, and uh, I was doing a live shot, and we were having technical difficulties, which so often happens in live television news. Things just sometimes don't work. And I worked at two different stations, so News Channel 8 and ABC7, as I mentioned earlier. And I couldn't hear the producer talking to me in my ear, the anchor. So I, had, I asked my photographer to cue me when I should start talking. And um, so he happened to be listening to the News Channel 8 anchor, but I was supposed to be on Channel 7. So he cues me to start talking, and I start talking to him live, and then all of a sudden he's failing his arms back and forth saying, stop, stop, and I'm like, I was just so, I just didn't know what to do. I thought, am I live on the air right now? And I'm just supposed to stop talking, what do I do? And so I kind of had this scowl on my face, like looking at it, I'm like, what is going on? And then I thought, well, I don't want to be in front of the camera anymore, I'm just going to walk off camera. So I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> so then I get a phone call, and it's from my boss. And he says to me, what just happened? It's like, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean? I just, got, I just didn't want to be in front of the camera because something happened. And he goes, Gordon was just, the anchor, was just tossing to you in a double box. And you just walk off camera as he's tossing to you. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, are you serious? <laughs> Thank God I didn't use any bad words or anything like that. So it could have been a lot worse. And that, no doubt, would have ended up on YouTube. Um, but that was absolutely mortifying, and to this day, I think it was probably one of my biggest um, embarrassments. But I have so many, I can't even begin to tell you all. Um, and it, you know, at first when I would make mistakes, I thought, oh my God, this is just the end of my career. This is it, you know? And then you kind of realize everyone makes mistakes and you get through it, and uh, it's all in the way you deal with it, you know? So. It is. It just depends really sometimes where you are. I mean, sometimes they're very tight-lipped, other times um, they're more talkative. Um, the challenge actually is you have, to be, um, you have to be skeptical. You always have to be skeptical as a reporter because people could tell you something, officers could say something, but they have their own motive or they might not really know, but they're telling you something like it is fact. And so you have to be super careful, especially when you arrive on a scene someplace new and you don't know these people. And that's why um, I, I rely heavily on sources that I've developed a relationship with that I can trust, that I know what they tell me is factual and accurate. So that's, that's what I try to do. Um, but oftentimes you find that the, the PI, they call PIO, uh, PIO's public information officer, they, they usually stay pretty tight-lipped. It's tough to get information from them. So it can be, can be a bit of a challenge, especially when you have to just fill airtime and talk about something and they're not giving you much information. It can definitely, definitely be a big challenge. On a day-to-day -day basis? Well, for work. For work, for my current, what I'm doing now. <laughs> I was going to say, thanks for boiling it down for me. I appreciate that. I think that, uh, gosh, there's, there's a lot. It just really depends from covering breaking news. I think, obviously, the fact that you're just going nonstop around the clock and you still have to be live and look like you have it all together and look like you're just... You're just so well rested and put together, and that's that's definitely difficult when you're in those those tough situations, getting two or three hours of sleep a night. I think that um, anchoring, when I'm anchoring, probably one of the biggest challenges, and I sort of said alluded to this earlier, is you have to you're carrying a show and you are live on the air, and 
the producer can get in your ear and just say, talk about something, and you just have to talk about it and make it look smooth and, and, and ad lib and talk extemporaneously, and that's not always easy, you know? And so I think that that is certainly a, a big, a big challenge as an anchor, and that's why it's so important, again, going back to what I said, is to be sort of um, well-read and up to speed with current events and so forth. And even being a reporter live on the air, I remember in Cleveland, um, there was a time where they, uh, there was a, a, the arraignment going on for Ariel Castro, and I couldn't hear, we were having technical issues, and I couldn't hear at the arraignment what was going on, and they came to me and said, Pam, uh, so, so could you recap what just happened for us? <laughs> I didn't know what just happened because I couldn't see it, but yet I had to fill air time and talk, you know? And so you get put in those situations as well where you are throwing a curveball and you're not seeing it coming, but yet you have to make it, make it look effortless on the air and like you've got it all together. So I definitely think that that is um, probably one of the biggest challenges among others. Pamela, I think we have time maybe for one more question. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, there are three important principles I follow as a journalist. One is to be accurate. Another is to be fast, trying to get the information out there as quickly as possible, and also to be fair. To me, fairness is what makes a true journalist, being able to tell both sides of a story and putting your own beliefs aside. And some of the best journalists I know, I was talking about Anderson Cooper earlier, he does a great job of that, among others. Um, you would never know what their beliefs are because they tell the story in, in such a fair way. And that, to me, is what being a reporter is, you present the story, you present both sides of the, of, the, of the story and all the facts, and it's up to the viewer to decide. It's not up to me to decide for the viewer. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Pam Brown some really giving sort of keynote speech. I've covered several events and I've seen lots of events and I was a little nervous coming in here but you guys made it easy for me. You asked great questions and I just loved all the enthusiasm and I hope to be able to come back here to High Point very soon and meet with you guys again. So thank you all, really, thank you.
and she speaks with most, I mean, I've told thousands and thousands of people how to speak. She's got natural voice. She has structure. She can answer questions. She moves her body across the stage to give eye contact. She makes every one of you feel really good when you ask the question, even the couple of dumb questions I've heard. <laughs> 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 That's the thing, the dumb questions. Adults, by the way. <laughs> and she makes you feel special. Those are things that are really hard to teach. And I don't know if she told you this or not. I don't know if she I didn't do that. I should tell you this or not. You would know this, but in the freshman class this morning, you had freshman yet? Freshman yet? Some of you, are you Tuesday or Thursday? Anybody in Thursday class? Okay, so you heard it this morning. And I asked the freshman class, Dr. Remember, which is something I never do. They have to go way over iPhones and iPads and all that. I asked them all to take their iPhone, take a picture, and to, uh, to um, text their mom. And just in case the mom didn't know who this lady is, to tell <laughs> the mom that this lady is the daughter of a former Miss America named Phyllis George. And while you may not know who that is, your parents know exactly who Phyllis George is. She was the most elegant, most memorable um, uh, Miss America in my recent memory that uh, the other one that's one of my very, very favorite is Heather Weisstrom McCollum, whom mm -hmm. we brought here to High Point. Heather Weisstrom is hearing impaired, and she's asked the most beautiful that I remember Miss America. She couldn't even hear the music. And I can still remember her operative line. She said, I heard the music in my heart, which I think is a lovely, lovely line. What she really did was practice two hours a day for two full years to do this ballet number so far. Everybody likes Kentucky Fried Chicken? Fried <laughs> Chicken? Her daddy was a big shot at Kentucky Fried Chicken, so if you guys want samples or free meals, <laughs> this is And I don't even like fried chicken. You believe it? So, uh, so Pam comes from a family of a lot of talent, a lot of skill. But that's not always a guarantee that the person will turn into that kind of person. And I want to actually add to that, because I don't want you all to think that all of a sudden, oh, you can't relate to me because I come from this background. In fact, in some ways, it's made it harder yes, yes. on me, um, because I've had to sort of overcome the perception of people thinking, oh, she has her job just because of who her parents are, or She's in this place in life because of who her, her parents are. You know, again, we're all. That works only for about five minutes. Exactly. It opens the door, but after, it doesn't. After that, we have to have the skill, the talent, the spark, the tenacity, the sustainability to keep it up. No one ever has a question to ask about you and my you. So, we've asked our fraternity Pam Brown if she will serve on our advisory board at the School of Communication. And she said, no. <laughs> I have other things to do, I have chicken to worry about. <laughs> so she said she's glad to do it, so she, when she's back in the area, she'll be with us here. I know she's <laughs> Excited. I'm ready for it. I feel like I've earned it, right? <laughs>